But some of Paul's letters are forged, yeah. So by, by the consensus of scholars, yeah, yeah. So what about but the Gospels as well, right? Because there's, I think... No, because they're not claiming a particular authorship. I know it says the Gospel according to Matthew, but these, these titles were added uh, uh, late in the second century. Uh, they were not part of the original... It doesn't actually say that within the Gospel itself that it's by Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, for example. So they're not seen as forgeries. Okay. So but how, what do you say about the, some of the early church like authors like Papias or Eusebius, um, or even like some of the Polycarp, right? So we, we have some of these early sources that go all the way very early. I mean, within... Well, second century, yeah. yeah. Second century, but, you know, this yeah. is only a few decades after... Mm the time uh, that the Gospels were supposedly written, right? But they're, the biggest thing is that they're all claiming the same, and preaching the same thing, which is that Jesus, you know, died and rose again. Oh, yeah. Right, so... They all believe that, yeah, yeah. So, to me, it almost... And, and in the case of Polycarp, he was a disciple of John, the disciple of Jesus. So, if he was... If he's being... If he's preaching that... And he well, he said he heard... I was a disciple. He said he heard uh, him preach as a young boy or as a, as a youth. He heard him preach. I think that's what it says. It's not quite the same as being a disciple. But, uh, but even if he was, what is... Uh, I mean, uh, this is all fairly standard stuff, but what, what might be your point in this? Uh, I guess the question um, is, is that my biggest thing is uh, how can you... So in, I know you're a Muslim, and, and to, me, to me, I think the, the biggest thing between Islam and, and Christianity hinges on who Jesus claims he was. All right. Right, and so that's where it really... Like, that's so who, who, did, who did Jesus claim he was then, in your view? Well, according to the Gospels, he claims divinity in the Gospel of John, right? And so I think the question is... is and, and, and Which he does in John, you're right. Yeah, yeah. And so that, that's the thing, is that the way that you set about, like... And do you mind if I'm not on camera? Okay, thank you. Uh, What's your name, by the way? John. John. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'm Paul. John Paul. <laughs> Both named after... Apostles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> How embarrassing. <laughs> Come and cut that bit. I don't know. I'm only joking. <clears throat> no, my, my, big, my biggest thing is uh, <clears throat> I, I'm just trying to understand your thinking because you came from a Christian background, and that's where I'm, I'm standing right now, is how were you able to look at some of the historical... I guess you could say statements made by the early church fathers who attributed the Gospels to the disciples of Jesus, or in the case of Luke and Mark, to those people. There's lots of questions there. I think in terms yeah. of the attribution of the Gospels, the earliest account we have of an early church father who says that our Gospels were authored by Matthew, Mark, Luke and John is Irenaeus in the late second century. Before that time, we have no statement of anyone like Ignatius of Antioch, for example, or Justin Martyr, or whoever, stating that Matthew, Mark, and Luke and John were the authors of those Gospels. Yeah. So it's Irenaeus. Uh, probably about 180, 190 is the earliest account we have of anyone attributing these Gospels to the Apostles. Yeah. Before that, some of these statements uh, that are found in, say, Matthew are quoted, but they are not quoted as being part of a particular Gospel. They, did, they might just be sayings that were circulating in some other form. Um, we don't know. What about Papias? I, I, I what was, about him? I, I thought he had attributed the Gospels, or at least two of the Gospel authors. No, uh, 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 yeah, Irenaeus is, uh, uh, I mean, everyone says it's Irenaeus. But in terms of who Jesus was, I mean, I'll give you the headline, then I'll unpack it a bit. The, the consensus of Western scholars now is that Jesus saw himself as a prophet. Uh, a particular kind of prophet, an eschatological prophet or an apocalyptic prophet, yeah. but a prophet nonetheless. So he is a prophet like the, Isra uh, the Isra uh, Israelite prophets. Uh, I don't know any scholar who thinks that Jesus called himself God. Now, I, I know that's the common belief for Christians, but I, I don't, that's not what history says. Now, how do they come to that conclusion? Well, what are our sources for the life of Jesus, his, his teaching? Well, we have multiple sources. We have uh, the earliest sources, I mean. So we have Mark, uh, we have Matthew and Luke, and we have something called Q, Quell, which is, well, you know about that, yeah. material used by Matthew and Luke in addition to Mark. Yeah. And we also have things called M and L. These are material unique to Luke in L case, and unique to M in Matthew's case. Um, these are our earliest sources. And when you look at those, um, an interesting picture emerges that Jesus doesn't call himself God anywhere. 
Now, what about John, you say? Uh, yeah, he does there, but John is usually now seen as a highly interpreted, uh, almost like a meditation on the significance of Jesus for the author of that gospel. So, for example, what one eminent scholar has put it like this. John believed Jesus was the light of the world. The author of the four gospel believed Jesus was the light of the world. So he put those words on Jesus' lips. So Jesus, he has Jesus say, I am the light of the world. So if you just change the pronouns, uh, you get a, from the first person to third person, you know, he was the light of the world, you get a better understanding of what John is really about. It's a, it's a, 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 a testimony to Christian faith at that time. It's not really the historical Jesus speaking. That, I would say, is the view of, in fact, uh, I'm thinking one, uh, E.P. Sanders, an American scholar who just died recently. He, 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 in his book on the historical Jesus, he said, that is why 99% of scholars in the last 200 years have gone with Matthew, Mark, and Luke rather than John for the historical Jesus. 99%, including himself, of course. But that's a consensus. So John is a fiction, is some considerable extent, a fictionalized account of the life of Jesus. According to virtually all the eminent scholars at Oxford, Cambridge, Yale, Harvard, UCLA, if they have a theology department in your, in your part of the world, this is what you'll be taught. Those are all secondary so, sources. So the, the point here is that, <laughs> that biblical studies is dominated by Christians. With one or two exceptions, uh, Bart Ehrman famously is not now a Christian, but he used to be. I when read he, the book because you yeah. recommended that. Yeah. Which one? Which one? The Forge. Right. The, 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 yeah. Okay. So, so you know. I, I'm familiar with these these examples. I think, okay. I think for me, the way my brain works is my brain's like a web, right? And so I, I, I'm I like at, I like. So, so I'm looking at we have we're, we're hearing these claims, right, or that. Gospels were not written by who they They're not written by eyewitnesses. That's the other thing. So the, that, that's the claim. That, okay, yeah, let's just there's good evidence. There's reasons for it. It's not just a, a claim. There are, we, I can go through the reasons now. There are reasons why mainstream historians, experts now, experts on the gospel, people who spend their lifetime studying the gospels, do not believe in the main that they are written by eyewitnesses. This is a commonplace. This is not um, a marginal belief or a Muslim belief or a, a radical belief. This is the standard view now, because there's really good reasons why people believe that. But even, okay, let, let's just assume, let's assume that that is the truth, like that, that's the case, right? Because there are biblical scholarship that would argue the opposite. But then when we so, look so, at, Such as? Um, what's his name? David, um, I'm, drawing a, I'm drawing a blank, I apologize. But look, 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 I just want to say, okay. like, let's just assume so I'm not aware of any, any mainstream scholars. I'm not saying in America, in America there are evangelical scholars who would say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written by the authors attributed to them, yes. Yeah. But these, these tend to be motivated by uh, religious belief in inerrancy. So they believe the Bible is inerrant, it doesn't contain any errors. So therefore, when they open the Bible, they can see it says a gospel according to John. Well, it's written by John. Now, that's not a historical judgment, that is a, a religious judgment, sure. a dogmatic one, actually. But it's not based on historical considerations, I would argue. Yeah, I, I guess so, and I, I see where you're coming from, and that makes perfect sense. I think for me, like, or, or, where I'm trying to make sense okay. of all is that you have almost like a parallel, so you have the, auth the chain of authorship, it's almost like the Hadith, right? You have your chain of narration, right? If there's a break in the chain of narration, uh, you know, you may not necessarily trust it as much. But however, you also have the historical account from Eusebius and even earlier sources that may not necessarily attribute the Gospels to the authors, but they're also, they are saying the same thing in terms of what the disciples preached and what happened to that. Oh, I see. Person. Okay. We haven't gone so, into that yet. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah, there's so much here. Yeah. I, I, should just, I disagree with that because I think okay. it's much more complicated than that. Okay. If we look at all our sources in the early, uh, early centuries, not just the orthodox ones, the ones that came to be accepted as mainstream Christianity later on, well, we notice that, that what some people call Christianities, actually it's John Barton, Professor Oxford, uh, who's also an Anglican clergyman, uh, uses, said this to me, he said, the word Christianity really is just an umbrella term. Within it there are, there are several, there are a number of different Christianities, they're different religions really, they're not actually the same religion. They all may say we believe in Jesus, but in terms of the, the, the doctrine of salvation, soteriology and so on, they're quite different. So for example, if you look at the the people around Jesus' brother, James, Yaakov, actually yeah, a real existing guy, who was actually the brother, one of the brothers of, of Jesus. 
What do we know about him? Well, he headed up the church in Jerusalem, according to all our sources, Eusebius, uh, Esepicus in the second century, uh, Josephus. Well, the, even the Book of Acts alludes to that. But what was his religion? What, was he what we would understand today, be Christian? Well, no, because he was, all our sources unanimously say that he was a pious Torah observant Jew. A pious Torah observant Jew. So the, the, this guy was the head of the church. According to uh, some of our sources, like Eusebius, he was elected or appointed by Peter and John. He, he was like, to be there. So the their, is, their, why their, is that important? I'm coming to that. Why, why, I'm is, coming to why that. is Paul's position important? It's James actually I'm talking about. Um, why is it important? That is, a, that is a question. And the answer is this, that in the very first generation of the people who knew Jesus, we had fundamental disagreements or differences about what that meant. Some like Paul, who is now in our New Testament, in Romans and Galatians and so on, believed what modern evangelicals might believe, more or less. Yeah. But people who followed James were very hostile to Paul. And we know this even in Galatians, it says, uh, Paul says this, because what James would have taught, he would not have believed that his brother was God. He would not have believed that salvation was through a sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He believed, as a good, pious Jew, in a, a, a temple-based religion, like we see explained in the Torah. And indeed, that's the evidence. He practiced Judaism. Now, Paul said, for example, in Ephesians 2.15, that the law, with its regulations and commandments, has been abolished. So what, yeah. about, so what about... The James story? taught the opposite. Wasn't so, Paul so what, 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 what I'm trying to say is that there were multiple different understandings of what it meant to follow Jesus. My point is this, that those who actually knew Jesus, we can be certain, I'm certain, that James knew Jesus, because they were actually blood brothers, yeah? He had a very different understanding of what it meant to follow Jesus than those who hadn't met Jesus, like Paul. Paul never met Jesus. So what, 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 what I'm saying is that the later second century, you mentioned Polycarp, Papias, we spoke of RNS. These are what scholars call the proto-orthodox pro, proto scholars who, who, who came to establish the great church, i.e. the Catholic Church. I don't mean the Roman Catholic Church, in I mean the church with the sacraments, a hierarchy, where you had priests, deacons and laity, you had a bishop of Rome, you had the Eucharist as the actual flesh and blood of Jesus and so on. You had a, a, a clearly defined Catholic understanding. But, but I'm saying that that is a later uh, establishment of of a religion which is now called Christianity but in the first centuries we had people like the Ebionites uh, who were Jewish Christians who upheld the law and were anti-Paul they thought he he was an apostate from the true religion of Jesus and Why the evidence stick, stick with the primary source yes, Why are you going to secondary I, 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 sources? I, 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 because he's, 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 you're, you're weaving elaborate explanations using secondary sources we have the primary source we have the word of god here's two guys no but this is this is the guy going on and on about you're making authoritative you're making authoritative secondary sources we don't do that we don't do that. Stick with, can you show from the past? Anyway, um, you, you were saying, uh, John. Yeah, so I, I think uh, the counter to that, I would yeah. say, is in the Book of Acts. It talks about the... Uh, he won't after, stay after, with the, he after won't the, stay after with the primary source. Yeah. Yeah. He always goes vision, to secondary right? yeah, yeah. because that's that how he, he weeds his explanation. To basically dwell on this interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. He was going through... He was a... He was the Torah observant Jew yes. who had this revelation of right. Jesus yeah. being the Son of God. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It says when he came back to the Jerusalem church and and mm. and uh, J uh, James, the brother of Jesus, was the bishop of that church. Yeah. They received him and he gave his testimony and it says and they added nothing. You yeah. won't talk so, with somebody that really so, knows so what they're talking about. So they you won't talk with me, I guarantee you that. So, all, all, I'm a seminary graduate. I can talk to you. So it's a bit difficult when yeah. someone. So all that being said, I, I guess that's to me that indicates that he hears his testimony and he's Paul at that time.
time is already claiming that Jesus is God because that's part of his right. Come on, man. So, come on, man. Sorry. Um, so I guess speakers, like, speakers call now, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's, like, it's not easy so, so how, sometimes. I, I, yeah. You know where I'm going with this. So, so I, I, I do. I, I think. I mean, again, this is, this is an academic question to some extent. I, I think the, the the book of Acts is is usually seen by uh, academics or historians as a very uh, har harmonized, ironic account. What, they do, what he's doing is trying to downplay the conflict within the the church itself between. Uh, the Jewish Christian supporters of James and and Paul and others, because we know we know there's a big conflict because Paul himself, in his authentic letters, not the, not the forged ones, uh, Galatians for example, he talks about how men came from James and you know you get the sense that they are uh, they're not on on the on side with Paul at all. But what's really interesting, even in Luke's account in Acts 15, uh, at the uh, when you mentioned when. Uh, Paul comes to James, and James is concerned, according to Acts, because he has heard from people that Paul has abandoned the law. I don't know if you remember this passage. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is a very serious issue of concern, because James upholds the law. In other words, he follows the 630 commandments of the law of Moses. And what does Paul do? He doesn't say, well, do you know, the law's been abolished. We now go, but justified by faith alone. He's not a good Lutheran. He, he, he actually attempts to reassure Peter, uh, Peter as well, uh, James, by undergoing a, a, a purificatory rite in the temple, uh, I'm sure you know, to prove, to demonstrate that he, Paul, not only upholds the law, but teaches the law. Now, that whole thing doesn't make any sense historically, because we know from Paul's letters that he didn't, he, he said we're no longer following the law, we follow Christ, who, who is now the, the new Torah, if you like. So Paul, 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 Paul um, says, for example, I'm trying a bit more, Paul says in, in Romans, for example, that the food laws have been abrogated, there's nothing unclean. That's absolutely not what a Jew would say. Uh, because of, Why? Because Moses, the great prophet of God, who received the Torah from God, and says you can't eat pork, for example, and a bunch of other things as well. So Paul came across as, uh, to many, many Christians who were Jew following Jesus, as a complete apostate from the law. So the idea that Luke presenting Jesus now, uh, sorry, the idea that Luke is venting Paul there, either Paul was being a disingenuous, in other words, he's trying to be, ins he's insincerely trying to con James into believing that I, Paul, am an upholder of the law. When we know he's not in his letters, or all the Paul's letters are, are somehow mistaken. And I think uh, histor historically, historically, we have to believe, I think, that occasionally Luke is, is harmonizing, presenting such an ironic account, smoothing over the conflicts within the early church that is not historically reliable in many instances. That is completely that's, that, that's my heresy. Yeah. Heresy, I like that's it. Heresy. I see, I see. You either believe the word of God, However, I would say you either believe the word of God or you don't. No. Let's go with it. Yeah. He's yeah. using the scriptures. There's, there's, there's further, if you keep reading, they all, there's always, there's always a, even when there's disagreements, there's always a sense of unity. They bring them oh, yeah. back together yeah, absolutely. and they pray over it, but yeah, yeah. never in the... In I would question if that's historical. But what do we have to say that it's not historical? We have Paul's letters. Okay. Because but, but in Paul's letters, he, you see, it comes, if I can just bring it down to something where I think is even more fundamental than this. If we, it's what Muslims call the Injil, uh, it's in the, in the Quran, the, the Gospel. If you look at the gospel of Jesus, the gospel that the Quran says was given to Jesus, the, that, that Jesus actually went around preaching in Judea, for example, even in the synoptic gospels talk about this, it, it says that in Mark, that Jesus went around Nazareth, Galilee, preaching the gospel, evangelium, yeah? And then we, 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 we identify that message, good point, what is this, yeah? And then we compare that with what Paul preached. We will notice these two different religions. Two different religions, okay? I know, I know Bart Ehrman says this, and, and I'm not saying therefore he's right, but anyway, he does say this as well. Because if you ask, for example, how are we made right before God? How are we justified before God? Uh, religiously, spiritually, as human beings, how are we made right with God? Or what does Jesus say? And then we see, but well, what does Paul say? And you can compare these two, and I can, we can do this now, just to do it we'll notice profound differences. And that, and that is are. why... And I that, can, that, let me that, speak that, to that. That, that is I, why... Is this a monologue? That, that, that is why... Because uh, we need that, to hear that is both why, sides. Please, please, please. please, please, please. Uh, that, that, that is why... Uh, that is why there are two things here, the gospel of Jesus and the gospel about Jesus. 
Muslims, we follow the gospel of Jesus. Christians follow the gospel That's about Jesus. And the gospel about Jesus is not really what Jesus taught, it's a religion about him. We believe that the gospel primarily, basically, is this. Believe in Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead for your salvation or forgiveness of your sins. The crucifixion and resurrection is absolutely central in Paul's thing. But in Jesus' message, his charisma, his angel, his gospel, not what goes around, it's not what, he, it's not what he preaches. What is Jesus' gospel? I, I, I mean, seriously, according to synoptic gospels, what does Jesus go around actually preaching? According to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Well, that, I mean, from your point of view, that's the Q source, right? Right, so, but. You know, tell, tell me what Jesus preaches. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what you should say the Q source. I'll yeah. tell you what, what Jesus what, what, what does Jesus actually preach in the earliest God gospel? That's John's gospel. That he began, That's John's he gave gospel. That's John 3.16. I know John 3.16. I'm not in interested in John. Not perish, That's why scholars... Okay. Let's look at the early liar. gospels. He that has the liar. son has life. He that does not have life does not have life. Have That's a cup of tea. Have a cup of, tea. Have a cup of coffee. Isn't that right? Go to yeah. the if lavatory. Has the son There's not going to be a break life. until he's finished. <laughs> he that believeth on me will not perish. That's what Jesus said. Okay. That's what he so, preached. Coming back to the earlier Gospels, what is Jesus' uh, uh, his Gospel no, to the Jews? Not. Because no, I'm a believer. You sound so angry, boss. In, 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 in the Gospels, no, no, no. The Gospels where Jesus is claiming. No, no, no. What, 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 what was his message? What was his message? Yeah, I mean, I think the message... But when he went around preaching to people in Nazareth, Galilee, what was his message? What was it? What is the Gospel? Uh huh. And what is the kingdom of heaven? Himself. Okay. Does he say that? Uh, does he say that, or does he say his father's kingdom? His father's kingdom. Right. So, and father is who in Judaism? God. God. Right. So, talking about God's kingdom in breaking in the world. Okay. So, how are we saved? What must I do to? How are we? Look, this is a very precise question. And there's a reason for asking. How are we justified before God? Because this really matters to Paul, by the way, and to the reformers like Martin Luther. We talk about so, uh, uh, sola fide, but what did, what did Jesus actually teach about, I mean, should I give you the answer or do you... I don't mind. Okay, yeah. right. So in Luke's Gospel, he told the story of the tax collector and the Pharisee, both got up to the temple to pray. The tax collector, the bad guy, he collects taxes on behalf of the Romans, he, what do you look up to him? He beats his chest and says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee, the good guy, he obeys the law, you know? looks at the tax collector, according to Jesus, this is Jesus' teaching, according to Luke, and says, thank God I'm not like that tax collector. I fast, I pray. Or a Muslim might say, I fast during Ramadan, I pray five times a day. I'm not like this sinner. And Jesus said, the tax collector went home justified before God. Wow. Why would Jesus say that? The man who wouldn't even look up to heaven and beat his chest and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Why? Because according to Jesus, whoever humbles himself will be exalted, whoever exalts himself will be humbled. What do Muslims do when they put their head on the floor in prayer five times a day in, in worship and prayer to their creator? They are humbling themselves before their creator. Who's their creator? Right? Because they are submitting to him. Who is their right? creator? So w when I hear that teaching of Jesus about justification, I then think, what did Paul teach? How are we justified before That's God? According theology. to the Apostle Paul. Yeah. According to him, he said, and he says opinion. in Romans and Galatians, we are justified by faith in Jesus and his death on the cross That's for our sins. That's correct. That is a different religion than the one Jesus preached. No, it preached. is not. Okay. It is not, and I can tell you the difference. No, 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 I, 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 want to, I want to hear you. I know answer. you don't, because you don't uh, want to hear the truth. I don't want to hear you. No, you don't. I don't want to hear you. Exactly. Uh, I want to hear what John says. So, uh, I think no, the gospel... What no, you can't say no. I'm, I'm, no talking okay. to, I'm talking well, to him, not you. Jesus came to preach the gospel of the kingdom. It was an, it, it was, it, the gospel of the kingdom was in fulfillment of the expectation of the sure, Jew, sure. right? I, I, no, the expectation of the Jew, right? Okay, so Jesus is that prophet, was preaching of the gospel, the, the, the kingdom yeah, that was the prophet, he's saying that. The kingdom that was to come. <laughs> Paul came One, two, three, as an four, interim five. message. The false message six was, is, was in between Jesus. There was a gap between what Jesus prophesied and when it would be fulfilled. Sure. Paul came to fill that gap. So Paul's gospel is the gospel of the kingdom, not is the gospel of Christ. 
Paul's gospel is the gospel of Christ, which is very different from the gospel of the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is future. You might have right? Yeah, but let me, let me finish. Yeah, let me but the, 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 yeah, the, know, gospel, the gospel I, I, of Christ I, 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 is present. Come That's on, why Paul come says, on. He, can't says you, can't you, can't he, he says, what he's Paul says, come on. I am not ashamed come of the gospel on. of Christ. I, 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 you, 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 sir. Please, please, please. So, please. so he's so I think the biggest thing, Paul's yes, gospel. So I think the biggest thing is that, okay, so I hear what you're saying. Right. And that, that actually, I, I, I could see the point, even though there, you do have to understand that there are claims of divinity within the synoptic gospel. There's a separate issue. At this stage, I'm interested in the, right, in the message separate, yeah. of, of how we're justified before God. Sure. Because the divinity issue is a separate question. Uh, we can address that in a sec. But according to Jesus, we're justified by humbling ourselves before our Creator, which is exactly what Islam teaches, actually, in the Quran. Um, but according to Paul, that's not how we're justified. So, in a sense, I'm asking, who has priority for, for us as human beings? What Paul taught or what Jesus taught? And we all agree that God sent Jesus. Everyone agrees, apart from Jews, that God sent Jesus. And so, whatever Jesus takes, we automatically prefer over any purely human uh, message. And, and that's why I'm a Muslim, because what Jesus taught about God and salvation is uh, pretty much what uh, Islam teaches. There are differences in the legal thing, the law, because we believe the Sharia uh, has supplanted the, uh, the Halakha, the Jewish Torah. But in terms of our understanding of Jesus, uh, uh, who Jesus was and salvation, we're with Jesus completely. But don't you, but don't you think that you need to give credit to the Gospel of John? And the reason I say that is because the, the Book of Acts also seems to validate that because it, it shares the story of after Jesus is ascended into heaven that the Gospel, that like in Acts chapter 3, Peter's first uh, speech to the early church. I mean, this is 40 yes, days yes. right after the crucifixion and the resurrection, right? Yes. And yet he is preaching. Yes. Christ died for your sins. Right? Exactly. And, and, yeah. and this is really, I'm glad you brought that passage up because uh, I actually have forgotten about it. But uh, let's focus on that very passage okay. in Acts chapter 2. What does Peter say about Jesus? Okay, he said, uh, paraphrase the NIV, he, he, uh, Jesus was a man accredited by God who did signs and wonders amongst you uh, by the power of God, as you yourselves know. Now, he does, he, the passage does say Jesus was crucified, you're absolutely right, but in terms of the God issue, like Jesus being God, Jesus being divine, Peter here explicitly says Jesus is not God. And this is, as you say, after the crucifixion, after the ascension, after Pentecost, he says Jesus was a man accredited by God. Now, if he believed what Christians believe today, he would have said Jesus was the second person of the Holy Trinity. He was divine, he was God incarnate, he was whatever terms you want to use. He never said that. In fact, in Acts, uh, well, let's, let's, let's take this passage. In this passage, he doesn't call Jesus God. He says he was a man. And this is because that's reflecting the very earliest understanding of Jesus amongst the disciples, I would argue. Why would he say he was a man if he was divine? Yeah. I mean, I'd have to read it, because I, I, I don't know what translation you're reading. NIV. NIV, okay. Which is the standard evangelical yeah, yeah, yeah. translation in America. Yeah, I mean, I had to reread it. Um, but any translation will do. It's more like I'm looking at it from the historical context because yeah. for me, when I, to me, there seems to be a historical synergy with the Gospels and then a continuation of the church that we see today. You see, which church? You see, yeah, uh, yeah it's a very Catholic argument, but, but, but the problem I have with that is earliest Christianity was very diverse. I, I mentioned James, I mentioned Paul, I mentioned, even Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians, he talks about the, those who say, you know, I follow Peter, I follow Paul, I follow Peter, uh, whatever. So it's very splintered. But there is plenty of evidence to suggest there was a massive schism between the so-called Jewish Christians and the more Hellenist Gentile Christians uh, who represent the Paul party, if you like, or the, the religion that emerged from Paul, a non-Torah religion. And Christianity originally didn't exist. The Jesus movement was a reform movement within Judaism, I would argue, that ultimately left behind Judaism, the Torah, temple worship, and became a Gentile religion focused on the worship of Jesus. And that is a complete change from the original religion of Jesus' disciples. And all this took place within a, within a century. So you get Ignatius of Antioch in his letters, beginning of the second century, s telling people not to follow Jew Judaism. You're not, don't follow Judaism, follow Christianity. Yeah. And that is the earliest time in history where the word Christianity is uh, mentioned, by the way. Christianity is mentioned in the Ignatius of Antioch. 
So here we have a clear split, a parting of the, way, the ways between Judaism and Christianity. But originally, there was only Judaism. And that's the religion that Jesus followed. Muslims believe that the religion of Moses, the religion of the Jewish prophets, is all from God. And we also believe Jesus is from God. But Christians don't follow that. So if I were to ask you, I always ask Christians, a bit unfair, I don't mean to be, but I'll ask you, you know, do you like pork? Do you like a nice ham sandwich? Of course you do. But Jesus upheld the law on this, according to Matthew. And basically, you're not supposed to. If you follow Jesus, you don't eat pork because the Torah prohibits it. The only people who follow that law now are Muslims. So when it comes to actually following the life of Jesus, I think Muslims are much closer to the religion of Jesus than today's Christians who follow the religion of Paul and the later church, which is the Catholic church. I mean, I think that's a whole different, separate discussion. Uh, yeah, like, true. But I, I think for, for me, like, like where I'm studying the two, yeah. it really hinges on who did Jesus claim he is, and that's why. But who did he claim he is? I mean, I think he did claim to be God. Where? Apart from John. Yeah, I mean, I think it, within the synoptic gospel. Okay, so it's a, about, uh, Mark, for example, the earliest. Yeah. Well, let's, where where does he call to be God the first, in Mark? The first one that comes to my mind is the, the passage of before Abraham was, I am. But that's in John. You see, the thing is, all the art, there's some wonderful statements in the Bible on the lips of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection. I am the good show. All these amazing I am statements. But they're only found in one book in the entire Bible, the Gospel of John. Interesting. If Jesus went around preaching, saying publicly, I am the light of the world, for example, or before Abraham was, I am, taking the tetragrammaton upon his own lips, why, oh why, does no one before that Gospel know anything about this? Q doesn't record report Jesus speaking like this. Neither does Mark, neither does Luke, neither does Matthew, neither does L. All of our early sources, not one of them has Jesus speaking like this. Only towards the end of the first century do we find Jesus speaking like this in the Gospel of John. So historians, this is something E.P. Saunders actually discusses in his book, have had to choose. Do we go with John's portrait of Jesus claiming divinity, which you believe, or do we go with the earlier Gospels where Jesus never says any of this publicly, and they have overwhelming 99% have chosen to go with the earlier Gospels as true of the historical Jesus. If you do that, though, your divine Jesus is not there. Yeah, I just to me, though, like when you look at the synergy of the Book of Acts, right, because you look at the disciples carrying on the legacy of Jesus, right? Right? The Great Commission that we read about. Jesus says, go and disciple. You mean Matthew 28? What's that? Matthew 28, you mean? Yeah, but then that's continued on into the book of Acts. Is it, it, is it though? I would question that. I completely question yeah, that. Question. Because in the book of uh, Acts 28, where the Great Commission, which I don't think is historical for a number of reasons, uh, but anyway, it says, go into all the nations, ta ethne in Greek. I remember it here. Um, if you look at the early church in Acts, say at Pentecost, they're all Jews. There are no Gentiles. But hey, how can you say that, Paul? Because there are people from all over the world. So how can they not be? No, they're all diaspora Jews. It actually says that. There are no Gentiles in the earliest Christian community. At Pentecost, isn't that interesting? So the earliest church was not interested in bringing in Gentiles. That's the whole dispute with Paul. Do you remember? Paul says, ah, well, no, the, the, the Gentiles also can be part of our movement without becoming Jews. But the original disciples say, you've got to become, become a Jew to follow the Jewish Messiah and follow the law. Makes sense. If I want to be a Jew today, I, I can't say Paul, I'm not going to follow the law. Yeah, I think that was just Paul, though, because there's also, granted, this is from the book of Acts, but it's also the account of Peter, who has the vision of the unclean animals, and he's heard three times, rise, kill, and eat, right? Yeah. And so, and then God says, don't, you know, no, no. don't, uh, But what's it, what, what, this is a vision, which does say that, but at the very end of that passage, Peter exclaims, now I understand what, what's this vision about? Yes, it's all about clean and unclean food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's, it's not about, not about food. Okay, yeah. But, but you see, if that's true, just to, just for sake of argument, if that vision in Acts 10, is it? I think. I think so, yeah. yeah. If that actually happens, how do you explain Matthew 28? 
Because at the end of Jesus' ministry, apparently, well, it does say in Matthew 28, Jesus commanding Peter to go into all the nations. No, thank you. But only much, much later, in a vision that, that Peter resists. No, 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 I, I've never, this is not possible, you know. Peter's just heard this news for the first time in Acts. It doesn't make sense. So I, I, the reason why Matthew 28 is not seen as historical is because it uses the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this triadic language, which uh, reflects a later first century context. That when Christians started to believe, and you use this kind of language of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Secondly, about going into all the world. The early Christians didn't do that. They stayed in Jerusalem, actually. They were Jews. He weren't, it wasn't for the Gentiles. Yeah, the Gentiles would come to Jerusalem and worship the Jewish God, but they weren't, you had to become a Jew to be a follower of Jesus, because uh, he's a Jewish Messiah. So it's not seen as historical. Uh, even my quite conservative scholars, like Jimmy Dunn, I noticed when I read him on this. Matthew or the Book of Acts? Matthew 28. Because, it ref it, because the earliest Christians didn't go out into all the world. This is a, a late first century perspective on Jesus' mission, not particularly historical. Else, how would you explain Acts? Why does Peter have this amazing vision that is like, oh my God, which says Gentiles as well? But he should already know this from Acts 28. Well, I mean, think of how many times uh, God has had to speak to your heart, right? To you know, right? Like you, sometimes people need multiple experiences to get them on to the right path. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean, but you see the context of Acts, like in Pentecost, where all the people who were. Uh, um, uh, energized by Pentecost, all Jews, there were no Gentiles. Uh, and the whole dispute over the law, you know, do, do, do Gentiles have to be circumcised and all the rest of it. This is all new. They, don't, they, they never quote Jesus on this. They don't say, ah, well, Jesus says Gentiles, when they come into the kingdom, will not have to be circumcised or they can eat pork. He never says that. They, they, don't, they don't draw on Jesus' teaching. Have you noticed that? When they're talking, Paul never quotes Jesus. James doesn't quote Jesus on this subject because he never spoke on it. That's why he never expected the Jews. And indeed, in Matthew 15, Jesus said, I've only been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, when he basically called a, a Cain-like woman a dog, according to Matthew 15, anyway. He used racist abuse. Did you, did you know that story? Uh, he actually called a, a Cain-like woman a dog which is pretty abusive. I'm not saying the historical Jews have said that, but that's how Matthew portrays them. But that's a typical Jewish attitude towards Gentiles. Then, which is... Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure, is this even now? Uh, well, they see them as subhuman, some Jews, in, in Israel at the moment, we've seen this. The Palestinians are characterized as less than human. So, um, so I'm not trying to say, people like Jimmy Dunn, the, the British professor of New Testament studies at Durham University, have written massively on this. Uh, he's a Trinitarian Christian um, uh, about the great diversity within the Jesus movement in the earliest church uh, and, and, and how Christology developed and evolved over time. It wasn't like they believed Jesus was God in the beginning. Peter says in Acts 2, which you reference, Jesus was a man accredited to you by God, uh, through whom God, through who, through whom did the signs and miracles amongst you. So God worked these miracles through Jesus. Jesus didn't do them off his own back. If he was God, he wouldn't have done them through, anyone, uh, through any other agency. It would be through his own power. But P Peter says it was through the power of God. And that's exactly what the Quran says. There's actually a paragraph in the Quran, to paraphrase it, which says exactly that. Jesus did the miracles by the, power, by the permission of God. So Peter and the Quran agree, actually, on that. All right, yeah, good, okay. good stuff to think on. Thank you, I appreciate yeah. your time. Yeah. I, I, I've read it before, yeah. Have you? Yeah, okay, yeah. that's good. That's yeah, good. I've read it too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, nice talking to you, John. No, I appreciate, you know, like, yeah, I've, been, yeah. I've been watching a lot of your yeah. videos and it's been super helpful and, uh, and I... I, I, everything, everything I'm saying now is all borrowed stuff. There's nothing original. I just borrowed no, no, from scholars. It was really helpful yeah. because I really wanted to nitpick that very specific time yeah. and place because it's like the, the area that I'm, I'm most... Because the consensus of scholar historians now is that Jesus himself did not think that he was God. But there's there something I didn't mention, and I, 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 sh I, sh I kind of do want to mention just for the sake of the record, that in the ancient Greco-Roman world, and even, the, even within Judaism, actually, you could call a really great man divine, or even God. 
actually. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's like the Greek. The exactly. Greek and most Jews were Greek speaking Jews. So, um, to say someone was divine doesn't necessarily mean what modern Christians think that means. So, if I say someone is God now, uh, and I was a Christian, I say, well, he's the creator, he's Yahweh, he's the God of the universe. No, 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 no. That's not what they meant. They, they only meant, here is a man who has joined God in heaven, uh, you know, the, he's been resurrected to heaven, he's part of the celestial realm, he's divine. That's what, that's what the ancient Romans, Greek and Roman, believed, but a lot of people actually, not just Jesus. So that belief was quite common in the cultural milieu of the time. So it's not that remarkable. But that's different from in the, 80th, uh, in the fourth century, where they declared, using Greek metaphysics, that Jesus, sorry, the Son was of the same substance as the Father. Homo ousion, to use the Greek. Homo meaning the same, ousia meaning substance or being. That Jesus was the same being as the Father. This is hardcore metaphysics, which is quite a leap, I would suggest, from the fairly loose use of divinity language Plato was called divine, you know, Moses was called uh, divine. Philo of Alexandria, have you heard of Philo of Alexandria, the great Jewish biblical scholar and commentator? He lived pretty much around the time of Jesus, just before. He was a Jew, he wasn't a Christian, he was a Jewish biblical He actually calls Theos in his commentary. I've read it. Theos is the Greek word for God. But he did not believe Moses was Yahweh, obviously. He was a Jew. But he was using this kind of Hellenistic language to talk about great men. So when Hellenistic Christians call Jesus divine, I'm underwhelmed by that. I mean, of course they would, because that's how you spoke about great men. Jews spoke about Moses as Theos. I mean, it's all completely wrong in my view, because that language is only reserved for the true, one true God. And I don't think Jesus would approve of that either. But it's not remarkable. It's not like, oh my God, Jesus came to be divine, or they called him divine. Isn't this amazing? But of course they would have done, because they called also other people divine as well in the ancient world. It's what the culture was like. When the world's leading Jewish scholar in the ancient world, Philo of Alexandria, calls Moses Theos, you know you've got an issue. And that's not unique. He was never scandalized, oh my God, this guy's a hero. No, he was, you know? So, even the Bible actually calls human beings God. David is called God in Psalm 45. He's directly addressed as God. Psalm 45, look, look it up, folks. Um, well, I, and I think that's why, that's why the book, that's why the Gospel of John, I think, is so powerful. If it actually is the words of Jesus, why it's, it's quoted so much is because Jesus says, before Abraham was I am, which is basically drawing on that special name like nobody claims. But the, he also, he also, he also sees God as someone else. So he, he says, you know, uh, this is eternal life. He's, he's praying to God. Is it, is it um, John chapter 17, verses 1 to 3? This is eternal life that they may worship you, the only true God, and Jesus, whom you have sent. So even at times, Jesus in John clearly distinguishes and separates himself from God. The only, you, the only true God. He's not saying I am the only true God. And also, by final bit of evidence, at the end of the Gospel of John, what does the author of that Gospel say the purpose of this Gospel is? Yeah, but let's just get it. Okay, the purpose of the gospel is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah. That's the purpose of the gospel. I can say amen to that. Every Muslim can. Every Muslim believes Jesus is the Messiah. It doesn't say that Jesus is God. Is the Messiah? The Messiah is a human being. There are lots of messiahs in the Bible. David is the Messiah. Uh, Cyrus the Great was even a Gentile. It was called the Messiah in Isaiah, obviously. All the kings are anointed by God. So that's a claim to the humanity of Jesus, and that's the purpose of that gospel. So what, like, as final thoughts, what, what, if you were to focus just, or give me references, or give me uh, things to read that are specific to the book of the Gospel of John, because I feel like for me, that's, that's, the, that, that's the central point, because yeah. I, I, when I read the Gospel of John, I'm like, it's, to, to me it's undeniable that Jesus is claiming I know, I, I mean, I, I'll admit to you in public here, this is, this is quite an embarrassing confession. When I was a Christian and I came, came across this, when I came across biblical scholarship, because I was looking for answers to problems I, I, I encountered in the Bible. So I went to responsible biblical scholars who were Christians, people I could trust, people like Jimmy Dunn I mentioned. And boy, did I get a shock, because I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. 
I didn't know that for the last two centuries, like the vast majority of biblical scholars, who are mostly Christian, do not see John as historical. In the words of Jesus, say in, in, in John, as historical. They, they see them as secondary. This is a euphemism for made up. I mean, this, it hurt me because I wanted to believe that Jesus said these things. So I had to ask a very, very painful question. Why are scholars saying this? And that took an awful lot of guts on my part, if I may say so. And it took me a long time to really come to terms with what the experts were saying about John's gospel. It was not easy really. I found really conservative colleague Craig Blomfield, uh, Blomberg, I mean, he's an American uh, biblical scholar at Denver Seminary, I think. I mean, he's a, very yeah, yeah, he's a real biblical scholar. Uh, you know, and, you know, he's written on John. And I really look for anyone who could help me to still believe that John was historical. The, jo the words attributed to John were historical. I'm not saying John is all fiction, it's not. I mean, there are, as there are other aspects which I'm not going to go into, like the, the uh, chronology is probably more accurate than the synoptics. But I'm talking here about the sayings of Jesus. But I came to the conclusion, very painfully, as a Christian, that the arguments that Christian scholars themselves were that the words attributed to Jesus and John are not historical. I found those arguments to be very powerful and persuasive. Now, this is not a chemistry lesson. This is not like proof. You know, you do a chemistry I'm This is absolute fact, because science proves X. Uh, this is not like that. Uh, this is history. So what, what we can only say responsibly is it's very unlikely, no, notice the caveat there, very unlikely that Jesus spoke like that. It's theoretically possible because we can't go back in a time machine. But it's very unlikely. Why? Because all the earlier evidence is, is against that. Jesus, if Jesus went around publicly speaking like that, which James, John says he was, not in private, not with his disciples in the hidden room, but publicly, why did no one else ever record him doing that? Why did Luke, who boasts at the beginning that I'm recording all of these things in an orderly way for you, dear Theophilus, why did he omit to mention these sayings? Why? Why did Matthew omit them? Why did Mark omit them? Why did Q omit them? Why did M omit them? Why did L omit them? All of our recognized multiple independent sources never record him speaking like that. That's the challenge, and I came to the conclusion, like everyone else, by the way, because he didn't. <laughs> um, it's a late first century sermonizing, meditation, reflection on the significance of Jesus for the author of the fourth gospel. That is the standard view now of everyone. Uh, apart from maybe some fundamentalist seminaries in the United States, maybe in Tennessee, <laughs> Um, who would disagree with that? Fine. But they disagree with it, not for historical reasons, but because they believe the Bible is inerrant. It's without error. So if Jesus is presented as saying something, of course he said that, because the Bible says he said that. But that's not how we do history today. That's a religious commitment. And you can believe that if you want, but I had to choose between how can I be an intelligent Christian that is open to responsible historical inquiry? And I had to choose, and I chose what I did, and that ultimately led me to Islam, because I realized the Jesus of history is actually very similar to the Jesus of the Quran, in terms of what he preached, in terms of who he was, his relationship with God, and so on, very similar. And this is the great fact that people don't realize. If you want to follow Jesus today, you're probably better off becoming a Muslim because it's the same religion in essence. And that was a big revelation to me. And I'm serious, by the way. A lot of the fundamentals of what Jesus taught and who he was, Islam is in agreement with history. Christians are not generally, unless they're quite liberal, uh, in terms of Christology anyway. So I invite you to Islam, because if you want to be a true follower of Jesus, you must today be a Muslim. It's the only religion in the world that says you must follow Jesus and gets him right. Jews deny Jesus, Muslim, uh, Christians worship Jesus, which is a great a sin of idolatry. That's why Jesus, Jews won't go into a church because they see it as a temple of idolatry. If you speak to Jews, they'll tell you this. But Muslims 
Jews can go into mosques to pray if they were if they ever wanted to in emergency, I suppose, and they are allowed to pray in mosques. I mean, because they're not uh, because mosques are places of true monotheism, true Tawhid. So follow Jesus, follow all the prophets of God, including the last prophet of God, Muhammad, upon whom be peace, and then you will be saved. That's the only way to be saved today. Well, what can I say? A lot of research to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I appreciate, right, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Pleasure talking. I appreciate your what's the word? Your extre extremely good. Um, it's been good talking to you. It's not always it's not always like that down here. Yeah, I, unfortunately. But <laughs> a good listener. A good listener. That's exactly. That's very respectful. Very respectful. Thank you. Very respectful. Your time. All right, cheers, John.